Thanks so much for coming back to watch the 11th video on my 11th Brave New World painting that I did in 2018 for private collector Fred Whitehead of the Jones Gallery in Kansas City, Missouri. I am the artist Ian Young. This is the 11th painting titled Sentencing, Two Islands and a Lighthouse, The Final Verdict of Mustafa Mon. This is probably the most philosophical part of the novel, where the repeating theme of universal happiness replacing art and religion and science and history comes back yet again, stronger than ever this time. At the end of painting number 10, John, Bernard, and Helmholtz Watson destroy a drug distribution center for Deltas and are gassed by the police and dragged to Mon's private corridors. The incident was all over the evening news, and the whole world is watching, including other world controllers, waiting with anticipation to find out what will happen to them. No one can see into Mon's private chambers or hear the actual conversation, so Mustafa can actually be himself with them, if just for a short while, more like a friend than an enemy. He shows them his own private stash of forbidden materials, war relics, historical documents, religious texts, artifacts, anything associated with the occult and other curiosities from before the population war some 400 years ago. He talks of how different things were in the early part of the 21st century and the four chat while comparing the different time periods. There are really so many different and important and phenomenal points throughout this entire discussion and the subsequent arguments in this part of the novel, I can't even begin to touch on them in one short video. John wants to know why everyone can't be born as an alpha plus, and Mon tells him because the human race would go extinct in one generation. He says the optimum ratio of intellects to epsilons is best modeled like an iceberg, like I, the one I painted in painting number seven, eight ninths below the water line, one ninth above. John points out how no one thinks anymore, how um, fleeting sensations that can never satisfy in the long term are chased relentlessly without any thought to the long-term consequences or repercussions. Mon produces scientific statistics um, that prove ignorance is bliss to the bulk of the lower castes and that the higher-ups depend on for their basic needs but John isn't satisfied or, or swayed by the statistics. Mustafa talks Shakespeare with the savage though, and poetry and art and science and, obscure, and other obscure subjects that are out of sight and mind of deltas and epsilons, while John, Bernard, and Helmholtz all listen closely and with amazement. For a few hours, as much to his own enjoyment as theirs, Mon humors their questions and their curiosities. He even admits in his own youth he was once a decadent scientist who was called into a former controller's office at some point. Mustafa admits he himself pondered leaving civilization in favor of an island because of how rigid and inflexible and conforming the task of being a world controller could sometimes feel, despite the glory associated with the position. Why didn't you, uh, John asked Mon at one point, very forward and, and very frank. Mon pauses for a few seconds at that point and says because he learned happiness is always the greater good, no matter how you slice it. And he realized it was more personally rewarding to serve the lower case like a good civil servant than chase personal dreams and antisocial beliefs at the expense of the respect of everyone around him. John and Bernard both scoff at the statement <laughs> and strongly disagree. And Helmholtz, um, no longer able to hold his tongue, voices his displeasure with basically every single point Mon is trying to make to them and flat out tells Mon that, you know, Mustafa kind of chickened out and, and made the wrong choice when he sold out his scientific genius in order to become a 26th century dictator. Mond actually agrees, and he asks Hemholtz what he thinks his own punishment should be. Hemholtz doesn't back down, 
It says the worst fate he could ever endure is staying in civilization and paying further lip service to the system he knows is corrupt and asked to be sent to an island, even going so far as to say the sooner the better. He even asked for a cold, bleak, winter climate where he claims he'll be able to produce something more different and be more creative. Mon smiles and genuinely happy for Helmholtz for being honest, happy with Helmholtz for being honest, shakes his hand and uh, dismisses Helmholtz to the vacation bureau where he gets to pick out his own island or the island of his choosing rather. Of course, this is Helmholtz walking here, smiling with the suitcase, ready to go. Bernard though, um, realizing there might actually be two true consequences for his actions this time around, uh, lies about his feelings and scolds Helmholtz's position in a pathetic attempt to save himself that falls directly in line with his kind of poor character. Bernard agrees with everything Mon says and promises he'll always put happiness first from here on out if he's just given one more chance, yet again, <laughs> but Mon doesn't buy it this time around. Uh, Mon painfully apologizes to Bernard, who he has always treated like a son and possibly might even be uh, Mon's actual son per the uh, hints Hubsley leaves scattered throughout the book. And then like with Thomas, after Linda, fin Linda fingered him as John's dad, uh, Mon calls for the police to send Mr. Bernarks to an island. Bernard, the problem child to the bitter end, goes kicking and screaming and arguing and yelling out the door, uh, hollering the entire time he's led away, knowing the only thing he ever truly liked, disrupting the social order for his own petty amusement is no longer going to be an option for him. John isn't familiar with their long history and assumes he will also be sent to an island as his punishment, which is exactly what the Savage wants. Mond is furious at John the Savage, though, because at this point, um, John has gotten some of Mond's oldest colleagues banished from the mainland for life, stolen his spotlight over and over again for all the wrong reasons, challenged his authority, destroyed an, an entire distribution center, caused a riot, and placed Mond in a very damned if he does, damned if he don't situation. Mond explains that though he would like to send John back to the reservation, his celebrity status will make the masses want to follow him out there and become interested in, in remote places and nature, so that's not an option. Mond explains that he can't send John to a, an island of his choosing either, because that would be admitting the experiment um, of allowing John to try and mesh with civilization was a total failure on his part. It could influence the masses to want to act up and get want to get sent away like their celebrity idol that, that they've been following. John admits to Mon, though, if, if he's allowed to stay, he will continue to question the authority of the state whenever he disagrees with it with no fear of Mon's wrath, and Mustafa takes John's challenge personally. In the movie, Mon decides, or in my opinion, decided before the arrest, to send John to a remote part of England where no one knows him, where John has a structure, a lighthouse to live in with just enough supplies and technology um, to survive and hunt for game, similar to how he lived back when he was in the southwestern part of the United States. In the novel, Mond hasn't decided what to do with John when John takes it upon himself to run off um, to the lighthouse to this remote part of England. So, there's a small difference on what happens between the movie and the book.